gracious God, we thank you for your word, for in it and through it you reveal yourself to us. Help us to hear you and to see you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you use a GPS when you travel someplace? Many of you do that. I'm kind of low tech. I'm not good with GPS. A couple of years ago, we took a trip to North Carolina and we tried a GPS that was brand new to us. We were going on a route we had been on many times before because we had vacationed there before. So we thought, well, this will be a good test because we kind of know where we're going anyway, but this could be helpful. And there's one stretch as you get into the far eastern part of North Carolina, we were headed to the Outer Banks, that it gets pretty rural, you know? And um, we knew that gas stations would get further and further apart as we got into that area. And so we always end up playing that game. Do we have enough gas to get us to the Outer Banks? And so we started playing that game. And pretty soon it became apparent, I don't think we do. I, don't, I think we're going to have to stop for gas. We've got this GPS unit. This thing will tell us where gas is, right? So we did whatever it was we needed to do to have it tell us where the gas station was that would be the next one approaching. And the first thing it said to us, and they all talk in accents or something, you know, this, this one had a British accent. And she told us, turn around. <laughs> it's like, well, no, that can't be right. The way, we know there are gas stations up ahead. So we tried it all again, turn around. And she was very emphatic that we needed to turn around. There was nothing more ahead of us in terms of gas that we would be able to purchase. So we needed to turn around and go back to find some. Well, we really knew there was a gas station up ahead of us. So we disregarded what this GPS unit told us. And we kept on going. And we did find gas. And it was OK. But we have remembered since then this voice saying, turn around. Wouldn't it be great if God did that for us? Wouldn't it be great as if, if we got started down the wrong path, we would hear this very audible voice telling us very emphatically, turn around. Because sometimes we get going in the wrong direction. Sometimes we get off the path, so to speak, and we end up going up some rabbit trail. And sometimes it's a while before we realize that we ought to turn around. And it would be nice as soon as, if this is our path, as soon as we did this, we heard a voice saying, turn around. And we could turn around and get back on the path. Wouldn't that be great if that, if that happened for us? This idea of turning back, turning around, coming back to God is an idea that we find throughout Scripture. We find it not only in the Gospel of Luke, we find it throughout Scripture, all the way back to the Old Testament, this idea of turning back to God. That's another way of saying repenting. We sometimes think of repenting as turning back to God after we've done something absolutely horrible and terrible, and we repent of our sin and go back to God. And yet, that word is really broader than that and can refer to simply turning back to God in terms of making God more of the central focus of our lives. And so this idea of repentance is important for us as people, because we sometimes do get on a path that will take us away from God. This story of Zacchaeus is very familiar, as Teresa has reminded us. And we've sung that little song, perhaps, about Zacchaeus being a wee little man and all of that. And he obviously had heard about this Jesus knew he was coming through Jericho, and because he's short, he has trouble seeing at public gatherings. So he figured out, I'll get up a tree. Now, Zacchaeus was probably a very intelligent guy. He was not just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector, which meant he probably had other tax collectors who worked under him. And so he probably not only gained a little extra from that little extra he got from the people he collected from, he may have gotten a little pushed up the line from those other tax collectors who worked for him. And so he was a wealthy guy. And everybody knew who Zacchaeus was 
But my guess is he didn't have any friends because of who he was. But he wanted to see Jesus. He wanted to see this one he had heard about. And so he climbs a tree. And sure enough, here comes Jesus. And Jesus sees him. Not only did Zacchaeus see Jesus, Jesus saw him. And Jesus didn't just pass by. He looked up. Zacchaeus, you don't need to be up in that tree. Come on down. Because I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus hopped out of the tree, greeted Jesus, and went almost into this immediate repentance thing. Jesus, I'm going to give half of what I own to the poor. Now, that would have been considerable. Remember that Zacchaeus was a wealthy man. So when he says, I'm going to give half of my stuff away to the poor, this is going to be a, a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of wealth that he is going to be willing to get rid of. And he says, beyond that, even those whom I have cheated, I'll give back four times what I took from them. Now, all Jesus has said at this point is, Zacchaeus, get out of the tree. I'm coming to your house. That's all Jesus said. And this is how Zacchaeus responds to Jesus. Now, those who were also part of this uh, gathering as Jesus made his way through Jericho obviously didn't like what Jesus was doing. They often didn't when Jesus was interacting with a known sinner. And so they began to mutter. That's a great word, isn't it? Other transla translations use the word grumble. The people began to grumble. He's going to the house of a sinner. It didn't stop Jesus. It never did. And Jesus tells us at the end of this passage that he came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. And so he was going to Zacchaeus' house. Now we need to think a little bit more about this Zacchaeus character. Not only was he short of stature and therefore would have been looked down upon physically, he would have been looked down upon by everybody else in Jericho and maybe a surrounding area. It could be that Zacchaeus was a regional tax collector if he was a chief tax collector. He would have been looked down upon by everybody else except those other tax collectors. You see, by being a tax collector, Zacchaeus was a part of the Roman reign, the Roman oppression of the people. Zacchaeus was a part of that. And so he was in some ways a traitor. He went on to tell the Romans, yes, I'll, I'll do what you need. I'll take as much money as you tell me I need to take. And the Romans would have told him, you can take whatever you want. Just give us this much. And so Zacchaeus always took as much as he could get. So he was despised because he was in with the Romans. But he was also considered to be unclean. And the reason was his job would sometimes require him to go to the home of unclean persons. And sometimes he had to go into their homes, and sometimes he had to take stuff from them which would have been unclean because they were unclean. Therefore, Zacchaeus was unclean, his house was unclean, and his whole family was unclean. So guess who came to Zacchaeus' house? Nobody except maybe when he called a meeting for those other tax collectors. Nobody came to his house. And so when Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Wow. Somebody's going to come to my house? To my unclean house? Not just because I had a little dust in places. Jesus said, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. That alone meant more than we can imagine, because we don't know what it's like to be considered unclean, to be considered somebody that no one else would want anything to do with. So we don't know what it's like for somebody to hear those words, I'm coming to your house. 
Zacchaeus was picked out by Jesus, was told that he was going to be Jesus' host at his house, and Zacchaeus' response was to change, to be transformed. This wealthy guy who was really given the authority by the Roman Empire to take as much money as he thought he could get from people realized that wasn't the way to be. And apparently had been thinking about this for a little while. He wanted to see this Jesus that he'd heard about. And the way Jesus responded to his presence made him realize there is another way. I don't have to be that person I have been. I can come back. And this one sent from God recognized me and is coming to my house. And so Zacchaeus said, you know, all this stuff, I've been doing this wrong. And I'm going to repay this stuff. I'm going to give away my wealth because I know that much of it is ill-gotten wealth. And I'm going to give back four times what those people gave me, those people I cheated. Four times what they gave me. And so Zacchaeus was changed that day. And not only did he decide to repent, to turn back to be the person he should have been, to turn back to God, his, his decision, at least in his mind, required an action. I'm not just going to say, you know, Jesus, you're right. I will become a disciple of yours. He didn't stop there. He took action to accompany his decision to return to God. And that's what true repentance is. It's not just a decision we make in our minds. It's a decision first, but then it is action that we take. Now, this idea of repentance, I mentioned before, we find it throughout Scripture. We see it from almost the very beginning of Luke's Gospel. If you go back to chapter 3 of Luke's Gospel, we hear about this guy called John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came proclaiming a message of repentance. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist was talking about that way back. And the people who came to John to be baptized, after they would, were baptized, at least as it tells us in chapter 3, they would say, now John, what should we do? What should we do in response to what we have just experienced here? And John would tell them. And he would say, well, if you have two coats, you need to give your coat to somebody who doesn't have one. You need to share what you have. And you need to do the same thing with the food that you have. Share it with others. And then it went beyond just this general crowd, and we hear about specific people who had come to John to be baptized, and they ask what they should do. The first specific group mentioned was tax collectors. And the tax collectors who had come to John the baptized to be baptized said, what should we do, John? And John said, you tax collectors, you should only take what the people owe. That's what John the Baptist had told the tax collectors. Now, we don't know if maybe Zacchaeus had been one of those who had gone to John years before. And that perhaps that had been working on Zacchaeus. And finally, when Jesus showed up, Zacchaeus said, I need to do perhaps what John had told him to do years earlier. And Zacchaeus was changed. Interestingly, there were some others who were baptized by John and asked, what should we now do because of being baptized? One of those other groups was soldiers who had come to John to be baptized. So perhaps Zacchaeus was thinking about this thing for years and finally it was time to say yes because of who Jesus was and because Jesus had recognized him and because Jesus has said, I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. And so Zacchaeus responded 
to Jesus by saying, I'm giving half of this away, and I'm going back to those I have cheated, and I'm going to give them more than they gave me. And this idea, we might refer to that as restitution. This restitution idea also goes way back into the Old Testament. We can go back to Exodus. We can go back to Leviticus and find the laws for restitution. Some of them were voluntary laws. If you voluntarily wanted to give somebody restitution, you were supposed to give them what they had already given you plus 20%. That was voluntary restitution. What did Zacchaeus say? I'll give them back four times what I took from them. Now, once you get into compulsory restitution, you find that that calls for twice, four times, or even five times that you might be ordered to provide restitution for somebody, depending upon the circumstances. So even though Zacchaeus is doing this voluntarily, he is exceeding even most of what was considered compulsory restitution in returning to those people what he had taken from them. He was going way beyond what the law called for. So we can say Zacchaeus truly was changed on that day. And we see that repentance, if it is true repentance, carries with it not just a decision we make in our mind, but it results in action we take with our possessions, with our time, with our gifts. It's not just a mental decision. We express our repentance by doing for others, as Jesus would ask us to do. And so we might ask ourselves the question, well, if I need to turn back from, from what I am doing, get off this path that perhaps I've gotten on, that I need to turn back to God, I need to repent, that's wonderful. And you know what? I think Jesus will be like this when we do that. Jesus will say, I don't care where you're coming from. I don't care what you've done. If you're coming back, this is how I am because I'm going to give you a big hug when you get here. And there is an action that goes with that. And that action can take all kinds of different forms. But repentance carries an expression of that repentance and that is an action on our part. It can be giving gifts. It can be offering ourselves in service. It can be giving of our time. But there's an action that accompanies a true act and decision for repentance. What might we want to offer? As we consider turning back to God, making God more central in our lives, what is it we can offer as an expression of that repentance on our part of returning to God it can be all kinds of different things. That same Jesus that looked up at Zacchaeus in that sycamore tree and said, come down, I want to go to your house. He says the same thing to us. And that same Jesus he gave his life for us, for each and every one of us. And so as we think about what we can give, what we can offer, when we look at Jesus and what he gave, what he offered, it was his very life. Our response to that is to offer our lives back in service to God. And we can do all kinds of different things with that. But God calls us to come back, always, always calling us to come back, come back. And so we're, we're asked that question as an expression of our turning back to God, what can we offer? Jesus offered his life. 